Good evening, everyone. So today I'll be discussing group in children based on the RCS guidelines 2020, the standard treatment guidelines of IEP 2022, and the Lancet seminar on group published way back in 2008. So as we go through the guidelines, let us see how the treatment are similar or dissimilar when it comes to a simple Brazil cough or a severe strider, which both can be manifestation of a croup. So coming straight to the topic, that is croup in children and evidence-based recommendations. So first of all, we all know that the etiology of croup is mainly para-influenza virus, which accounts for in fact 70% of cases. Influenza A and B, RSV, and metanumoviruses are some other viruses which can cause croup. And when it comes to the clinical features, we all know that the clinical features usually the croup starts with simple um, manifestations like a running nose and a, um, upper upper uh, upper respiratory infection or fever, and later that usually progresses to a barking cough. And if the uh, severity is a bit more severe, then the child starts having strider, especially when it is agitated or while it is crying. And if it is even more severe than that, if the narrowing is more severe than that, for initially there is intermittent strider followed by even strider at rest, uh, severe attractions and cyanosis. So now we need to understand this. Whenever you have a child who presents to you with respiratory distress, if you are going to see retractions in these areas, right? In the sternal retraction, suprasternal retractions and you can hear the sound also. Uh -huh. So these are the sounds that characteristically classify a strider. So we always understand whenever there is a suprasternal or sternal retraction, it usually indicates an upper airway obstruction. And especially when it is preceded by a fever or URA, the most common diagnosis definitely is a croup. Now croup can be of varying severity. What we have to be bothered about is when you have a child presenting to you with a fever, running nose, followed by barking cough, and now coming to you with strider, you need to understand whether it is severe or not. So what makes a croup severe? If the child's sensorium is abnormal, if the baby is lethargic, with a frequent cough, with prominent strider, even at rest, with retractions, then you take it as a severe cough. Remember, cyanosis is a very, very late sign of croup. So even when you have a severe crop, croup, the saturation may be maintained, but the retractions may be quite prompt. So now what are the risk factors for a severe croup? There are a subgroup of children who are prone to have a severe croup. For example, anyone with a pre-existing upper airway narrowing, in babies with Down syndrome, children with history of previous croup, and representation within 24 hours. That means they had come to you with a complaint suggestive of croup, you have given some medicines, and they again come back with persistent symptoms, more chance of those babies going in for a severe croup. And what are the differential diagnoses? The differential diagnosis, of course, is foreign body inhalation, epiglottitis, bacterial tracheitis, and retropharyngeal or peritonsillar abscess. So this also should come into our mind when a child presents to you with a strider. Foreign body inhalation, usually there will not be any fever. They would really complain of an acute onset, like child was eating something, then it started coughing or started uh, laughing and crying, and suddenly the sound came. Suddenly the strider sound came. That is the classical history of a foreign body inhalation. Epiglottitis child is usually more sicker. He looks more toxic and there is difficulty in swallowing. There's dysphagia as well as drooling. And usually the babies take up a sniffing posture that is keeping the mouth open. They will be letting a uh, scoop uh, forward. Bacterial tracheitis, again, is another condition which can cause croup along with fever and URA. But usually these children uh, appear more toxic and they will not respond to adrenaline nebulizations. When it comes to retropharyngeal or peritonsillar abscess, retropharyngeal abscess again can cause croup or can cause strider, but patients will present with throat pain, dysphagia, torticollis. Then you should think about retropharyngeal abscess. Investigations, remember in croup, the diagnosis is mainly clinical. So investigations have very limited role in the diagnosis and management of croup. Routine blood examination may help you differentiate between a bacterial cause of a respiratory distress. Like if you're thinking of a bacterial tracheitis, it may be of use. Then chest x-ray would classically show a steeple sign. You can see that the narrowing of the laryngeal inlet has caused a steeple sign similar to the church steeple. Now, what is the treatment? So treatment is croup is mainly three prong. That is systemic steroids, adrenaline nebulization, as well as 
steroid nebulization. Let us see how we use the permutation combination of these three important interventions in the management of grief. The first most important thing is always keep the baby calm. The moment you see a baby with spider, don't be in a hurry to take the baby from the mother's lap, put them on the bed and start an oxygen. No, let the baby sit comfortably on the uh, in the mother's lap itself. And if oxygen is needed or humidified uh, air oxygen is you're going to provide, provide it in the most unthreatening manner. That is just be a blow by you can give. For mild growth, steroids are recommended. For moderate growth, steroids with or without adrenaline nebulization is recommended. And for severe growth, it is both systemic steroids as well as adrenaline nebulization. Now, let us see how these things act. When it comes to steroids, we should know that symptom reduction happens as early as two hours. Earlier, we used to say that symptom reduction may take up to four to six hours. But the 2018 Cochrane Review now says that in group, just giving steroids itself, the symptom reduction happens within two hours. Steroids also cause shorter hospital stay and decreases the need for hospital return. So now the question is, which steroid? Do you want to give dexamethasone or do you want to give prednisolone? Both can be given, but usually dexamethasone is preferred. Why is it preferred? Because it has a very potent anti-inflammatory action which lasts for two to four days and croup typically lasts for 72 hours. That means if a child is having a croup, you give a single dose of dexa, dexa is going to have an action for three days and your symptoms will be resolved by three days. You don't have to repeat the steroid again. So that is why it is specifically a favored in croup. You don't recommend much dexamethasone in asthma because asthma is a recurring disease and dexamethasone is a long-acting steroid and naturally it will cause more of HP axis suppression. So you don't want the child to be repeatedly exposed to dexamethasone. That is why in asthma, we don't prefer much of dexa, but in um, croup, we prefer more of dexa. Now, which route do you want to give? Oral, intramuscular or intravenous? In fact, studies have shown that whether you use oral or intramuscular, there is no difference. No difference in efficacy, no difference in onset of action. So either route is preferable. If the baby is able to take orally, oral is preferable. Now, what about the dose? Classically, we have been using 0.6 mg per kg as a single dose, but there are recommendations where they recommend 0.15 mg per kilogram. And interestingly, studies have shown that there is no real difference between whether you use DEXA at a smaller dose of 0.15 mg per kg or a relatively larger dose of 0.6 mg per kilogram. But there is also a meta-analysis which showed that higher doses associated with more symptom resolution at 12 hours for children admitted with group. So that means if the disease is severe, it would be preferable to use 0.6 mg per kg. So that was regarding steroids. Now moving on to adrenaline nebulization. Remember, adrenaline nebulization is a very effective method of decreasing the strider in croup. The croup scores improves within 10 to 30 minutes. The effect is sustained for a minimum of one hour. That is up to 90 minutes it may be sustained, but effect is gone by two hours. So this you have to understand. So when you give an adrenaline nebulization, the child will usually show improvement, but there is always a chance of reappearance of strider after two hours when the effect of adrenaline wanes off. So, um, but when it reappears, it does not reappear with a severe form. It reappears with the same original intensity with which the baby had presented. And the doses, usual recommended doses, 0.5 ml per kg. But now many guidelines say that you can just take 5 ampules, that is 5 ml, and give undiluted nebulization. Because here again, the concept is same. In Like in asthma, we use blanket doses because if it is a smaller baby, the tidal volume will be small and the baby would be taking in lesser amount of the drug. So that is why adrenaline nebulization is also not mandatory that you follow the rule of 0.5 ml per kg. You can just take 5 ml, that is 5 um, respules or ampules and then give it as a nebulization. So now, what about steroid nebulization because we all want less invasion right and it's always difficult sometimes a baby to eat make them eat medicines so we always as a pediatrician you want to give something as an inhalation you're more happy so what does the recommend or what does the study say regarding uricinide nebulization and dexamethasone systemic in fact the study says that there is not much difference between the two so now where do we stand so if the patient is presenting to you with mild cough mild group, that is a barky cough, but no respiratory distress, no strider at rest. You can either give 0.6 mg per kg dexamethasone single dose, 
or you can give 0.15 milligram per kilogram of decimal. That is instead of 0.6. In fact, RCS recommends for mild group, 0.15 is enough. We may also use prednisolone instead of dexamethasone, 1 mg per kg twice daily for three days. So that is also an option in case of mild group. Now, there is a third option in mild group. That is, you can use budesonoid nebulization. That is, if the patient if this does not take oral steroids, if oral steroids are not tolerated, mild group, definitely you don't want to poke the child. So definitely you can opt for budesonide nebulization, 2 milligram. So 2 milligram, that means if it's a 0.5 mg rescue, you would require 4 rescues for a single nebulization. Now, what about moderate group? Moderate group is someone who is having intermittent strider at rest someone who may be having mild retractions also, but there is no continuous rider at rest, no severe retractions. So that is a child who requires a dexamethasone 0.6 milligram per kilogram orally. Along with that, you have to give adrenaline nebulization also. But any child who requires or who has been offered an adrenaline nebulization for a group should be observed for two hours for rebound. If the baby is okay after two hours, you can allow the baby to go home. Now, what about severe group? Severe group means a baby who has continuous rider at rest. So if the patient is hypoxic, provide oxygen in a non-threatening manner, then the steroids are definitely uh, indicated. And here, rather than 0.15, definitely go for 0.6 mg per kg. You can give it up to a maximum of 8 to 12 milligrams. Single dose is enough. And if vomiting is present, even in severe group, if vomiting is present and you don't want and uh, injection is difficult, you can definitely give budesonide nebulization can be tried. Along with that, give adrenaline nebulization. Usually, we uh, recommend adrenaline nebulization to be repeated if needed on an hourly or two-hourly basis. But if the patient is having a severe group, you can repeat at 20 minutes interval also. Now, after we have already, we have already said that once you have given a nebulization, you should always wait for two hours. See that even after two hours, that is even after the effect of adrenaline nebulization has waned off, if the child is stable, only then plan the charge. Usually for severe group, you would observe the child for four hours and then plan this chart because by four hours, the steroid effect would have come. So with the steroids alone, if the child is feeling comfortable, we can plan a discharge. Now, what about adding inhaled budesonide to a systemic dexamethasone? That is commonly we think about that, right? When the child presents to you with a severe distress, you have started, uh, you have given a dexamethasone and then you have, well, you feel like giving something more because the child is showing severe distress. But the studies have shown that there is no additional benefit in adding an inhaled budesonide to a patient who's already on systemic steroids in the form of oral or parenteral dexamethasone. Now, adrenaline nebulization, we already said, observe for two hours. If the response after the first nebulization is unsatisfactory, you can repeat at 20 minutes interval. Then once you have repeated the adrenaline nebulization, definitely observe the child for four hours. If at the end of four hours, the child is asymptomatic, you may discharge. Otherwise, the child requires admission and treatment. Now, we should know there is no role for antibiotics, antitussive agents, cup syrups, or decongestants. Absolutely no role. What are the complications in Crohn? Extremely rare. Most of them would respond beautifully to the above set management. If, uh, rare complications include bacterial tracheitis. You should think about bacterial tracheitis if the fever is persisting. If the child is looking um, sick, toxic looking, then you should think of bacterial tracheitis. And that can also happen. Viral infections, secondary viral infections after a group can happen. That is secondary bacterial pneumonia can happen. But these two things are definitely rare complications.